Good morning, good morning. Praise the Lord. Pastor Bill Emmons here, CFC Ministries International. CFC stands for Covenant Faith Center. And look at that. I thought I had all my volumes turned off. All right, now I don't hear myself. <laughs> you know, I have to double check all my devices because they all have volume controls on them. But, uh, and my lights are not on. Oh man, I don't know what I'm going to do now. Uh, wait for my uh, assistant to come back in. Um, anyway, good to have you with us. Praise God. The, the lighting is terrible, I know, because our we got the wrong lights on. Just um, a little bit of the uh, sidetracked uh, this morning. Been dealing with some issues we overcome in the name of Jesus. It's good to have you with us. Praise God. For those of you that don't know us, uh, uh, my wife and I have been pastoring for 45 years and um, 44 of that in California. And May a year ago, <clears throat> the Holy Spirit spoke to us and told us that it was time to make a change and we were to move back here, relocate our ministry. And that's not easy to do when your ministry is a church. <laughs> so we told our congregation, we notified everybody. And of course, this was before the COVID lockdown had been lifted. So in California, we were still locked down. And they didn't want churches to operate. They arrested pastors. They fined churches. Uh, we never closed down the whole time. We never got, uh, I guess nobody, uh, we weren't important. I don't know. <laughs> but um, they never bothered us. And uh, they never arrested, never came to our door. And uh, people came and got ministered to during that year and a half that we were locked down. <clears throat> so we made the transition. We moved back here and we're uh, online church now. So if you don't have a church, if you don't have a home church, we invite you to tune in every week. We do Sunday morning service and Tuesday night Bible study. And uh, with that, um, we minister to people just like we would if we were standing in front of you. And if you have a need, you can text a need or you can send it in comments. And uh, we'll see that and we'll pray for you. If you need counseling, you can contact us and we'll work out a time for that. Uh, we'll treat you just like a member of our congregation. We have uh, folks that support the ministry uh, through their tithes and offerings. And if you don't have a home church and you're looking for a place to sow seed, we recommend our church. <laughs> but um, anyway, things have changed over the last few years and, and uh, churches have gone through a lot of transition and uh, online ministry has become um, a dominant thing now because uh, primarily because of the shutdown that took place. That, that didn't hurt the church. It just gave us a new avenue of ministry. And uh, just a, a good report, we went from, uh, for 10 years, we were online with uh, Facebook and um, we were averaging 50 to 75 views per week, sometimes more um, and sometimes less, but that was our average. And uh, then when we made this transition, we've been steadily increasing. Uh, we had a high watermark about uh, two, two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, of 25,000 views in one week. And uh, where we've been averaging 10, 12, 15,000, all of a sudden we hit this high water mark. And I believe that God's setting new goals for us. So we're believing God to average, uh, our, our average, we want to be able to see a weekly average of 20,000 views. And then as that, we, we begin to surpass that, we'll set 25 as the average. And then if, when we reach that, we'll go to 30. My goal is to have literally to be able to reach hundreds of thousands and eventually millions of people through uh, our online ministry and any other way God opens up the door for us to do. So we are available for ministry. If any pastors are watching, we're not trying to, to take people out of congregations. We're not trying to take finances away from churches. We're here to do what God's called us to do, which is to be pastoral ministry, to teach the word, and to bring the healing anointing uh, into people's lives so they can receive their healing and their deliverance in the name of Jesus. Mary, I need you to turn on my lights. No, don't turn that off, we have no lights. 
<laughs> my my assistant, Pastor Mary, just came in and uh, she didn't realize we didn't have lights, and I didn't know it until uh, I uh, until we started the program. Oh, but now we got a lot of light. All right, well that's better anyway. There we go. Okay, so again we're glad to have you with us. You know the. The drawback to live uh, ministry like this, live broadcasting, is that any mistakes you made cannot be edited out. And uh, we've, we've had some interesting experiences uh, doing this. <clears throat> we've, we've had a, a lot of challenges, but praise God, we overcome them. And uh, we've been overcoming challenges this week, and we are more than conquerors through Christ, which strengtheneth us. And uh, we're glad to have you with us. So let's let's get into our worship, and uh, got a couple of great anointed songs with uh, this morning, uh, the goodness of God and um, our Father, and uh, but done in a way that I believe will be a fresh anointing. And remember, the moment we came on the air, the healing anointing uh, has been available uh, to receive. So as you see, the banner I put up there. Uh, it's healing time. Receive it now. The Spirit of God spoke to me, and, and there's a scripture that He gave us, and I don't, um, I don't think I put it in front of me. There it is, and this is out of Luke 5:17. It came to pass on a certain day, as Jesus was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law uh, sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Well, that same power, that same anointing is present to heal you today as you hear the word. The anointing destroys the yoke. So get ready to receive. Just take it by faith in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord now. Praise God. Let me get things um, set up here. So we got the right cameras in the right places. Praise the Lord. Of the goodness of God. 
God. I, I can identify with that song, the goodness of God. I've been in church all my life, and God has blessed. God has been faithful. God has answered prayer, healed, delivered us, provided for us. And, um, you know, sometimes the devil tries to make you think, well, where's God in your situation? Well, he's working, and he's working on our behalf, and he's always faithful. He's never let us down. Even when we're under attack, it doesn't matter whether it's a physical attack, a financial attack, um, you know, or some other area. God's still there. He doesn't fail us. He doesn't forsake us. He said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. In fact, in Psalm 91, he says, I'll be with you in trouble, and I'll deliver you and show you my salvation. And uh, how can you not praise God for his goodness when you got covenant promises that you can stand on and trust God to do what he said he would do. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Let me set this next one up. Hallelujah. Here we go.
Mary's God. Another powerful song, another anointed song. And uh, his is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Hallelujah. It's good to have you with us. Good to see Steve with us and Liz. Good to have you with us this morning. Praise God. And uh, I need to shut the computer down. So give me a moment to do that. Let's see. There you go. Power. Well, do something. There you go. Shut down. All right. We don't want to equipment running that we're not paying attention to because sometimes they do their own thing. I turned on the computer this morning. It was working perfectly last night. And uh, all of a sudden there's somebody talking behind the songs. A whole nother program, uh, something was running that we didn't do. And uh, it took me 15 minutes to wait for that thing to play through and stop. And I, I still don't know how, how it was doing that. Anyway, <clears throat> we, um, we do our best to check out everything before we start. And uh, sometimes things slip by. But praise God, we got it this morning. Hallelujah. God is good. He's um, full of kindness and goodness and patience and loving kindness. I want to share with you, I quoted to you part of Psalm 91. And the part here is near the end. And he said, um, uh, let's see. We trust and rely on him knowing he will never forsake us. No, never. We shall call upon him and he will answer us. He will be with us in trouble. He will deliver us and honor us. And with long life, will he satisfy us and show us his salvation? Well, I'll tell you, just those last few promises there in Psalm 91 by themselves are enough. <clears throat> Even if we haven't, nothing else. Excuse my voice. I've been, I've been winning victory today, this week, praise God. So um, we're going to go ahead and bring on our Instagram family and uh, get that started so I can continue with things I need to say. My voice is strong, it is healed, it is whole. My lungs are clear. I have strength in the name of Jesus. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And nothing's impossible to me because I am a believer. And I've been redeemed from the curse. I've been healed by the stripes of Jesus. He bore my infirmities, my sicknesses, my diseases on his body as my substitute. And by his stripes, I was healed. Therefore, I am healed. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Good to have everybody with us. Um, I see that uh, other people <coughs> are joining. <coughs> Excuse me. I want to give you your prosperity uh, scripture for today. This comes from Malachi 3, 10 and 11 and Isaiah 54, 17. And it says, the Lord rebukes the devourer for my sake. And no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved in the name of Jesus. Well, that's a good prosperity promise. Amen. Now, we put these in the form of a declaration or a confession of faith, but it is the word of God. And it's we're, when we declare it like that, we're to making it personal. We're taking God's word and making it our word. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I want to remind you that there's a website you're going to want to go to. There are a number of people who are, um, if not already declared, are acting like they want to run for president. And some of them, you need to know who they are and what their background is so you know the way they will um, vote the way they will respond, the way they will act if they were to be elected. And I think very quickly you can find out that we don't want more of what's been going on this last um, year and a half. I think it's clear that we, um, we need to change. And uh, I'm not going to get real political on you, but I think we need to talk about it because the change that we're experiencing is not for our good. It's for the good of a few folks. 
that think they're elitists, that uh, think they want to run the world, control everybody. But that's not God's will. That's not God's plan, especially for this nation. So go to www.highway61ent, Edward Nancy Tom, dot com. So www.highway61ent.com. And on there, you'll find information about some of the people who potentially may try and put in a run for the president. And it's just going to give you some accurate information. It's not guesswork. It's not, um, we think. It's actually uh, very clear proof of the way some of these people have uh, responded and voted and done in the past. And uh, they're not going to change their colors just because they're running for president. They may sound like it. They may promise things. But you can tell what people are going to do by what they've been doing. Amen. All right, so that's available for you. And um, you want to make sure that you take, take advantage of that. Uh, also, we have the, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a medical doctor or anything like that, but we have Dr. Zlinko's COVID protocol. And uh, if you're interested, um, we have it available. We can... Um, email it to you, text it to you, or, uh, yeah, just, <clears throat> we can send you a text with the specifics. And it um, doesn't involve a vaccine, so-called vaccine. So if you want that information, uh, send me an email or a text and let us know that you'd like to have it and we'll send it to you. All right. Um, what else we've got? I want to ask you to give us a little bit of help with our social media platforms. Uh, Truth Social is a great conservative social media platform. And uh, we're on there. You can find me at, you can type in the at symbol. That is W-R-D-M-N. And that should take you to my page. Or you can type in Pastor Bill Emmons. That should take you to my page. Go on there and like our, our uh, different programs that we put on there. Just go down the list and hit them, like them, share them, you know, go through the routine to help us reach more people. Because every time you do that, more people are going to get it. And then I'd like you to give us a hand with uh, increasing our, our traction on it. Rumble. Uh, you can find Rumble or Rumble.com. And on there, you can find our page. By typing in WRDMN777. Now, the ones that are doing very well for us uh, are Gab Plus. We're reaching the thousands there. BitChute, we're reaching quite a bit more than we were. And, of course, Facebook is doing pretty good and increasing. So continue to share, continue to like, continue to follow and, uh, of course, if there's a notification uh, on that particular platform, click notification. That way, anytime we might come on, other than our regular service time, you'd be notified. All right. Praise God. I think that's it for announcements. And, uh, you know, this is church. So this is what I would do in my home church. Uh, we would make announcements, uh, maybe receive tithes and offerings at this point. And um, we are an online church. So tithes and offerings are something we can encourage you to participate in to help support the ministry. Uh, but um, we can't pass the, the bucket, <laughs> you know, right here. So it's up to you to respond to the Holy Spirit on that. And at the end, I'll put up a screen that will tell you how you can um, give and sow seed into this ministry. And then monthly partners, those are the ones that really support this ministry. People that commit to praying for us people that commit to getting behind us with their faith and prayers and any faith projects we've got going. And then they support on a monthly basis. So we can count on that. We can fix a budget based upon uh, the commitment of uh, folks that watch. Uh, we can fix our budget and pay the bills and so forth. So this uh, online church ministry is 100% supported by uh, those that have a desire and an impression by the Holy Spirit to give 
and primarily through our monthly partners. So pray about becoming a monthly partner with us. Amen. All right. Um, this morning's title, if you're taking notes, now you know I'm a teacher, and I try not to be boring. Uh, I believe if you'll learn, if you listen, you'll learn. And uh, I try not to be too theological in the sense of using big words and hard to understand phrases. And if I do use something like that, I'll explain it to you. But for me, it's always been, uh, you know, just when I hear the word presented in a simple to understand, easy to understand format, I learn and it helps me. And I've carried on that same uh, type of teaching format in my ministry. I want to make it simple. I, I don't, I don't want to be so theological that you wonder at the end, well, what did he say? I want you to be able to apply it to your life, the principles that we're learning. All right, so tonight, today's uh, message title is Covenant Sacrifice. Covenant Sacrifice. Guess where we're going to go with that? <laughs> um, this is, as you know, we've been doing a, an ongoing series that began over a year ago called the Deeper Walk Series. And what the Holy Spirit uh, spoke to me to do was to go back over our basic foundational teachings and take them a step further with revelation. And, you know, revelation is how you grow. Uh, not just because you hear something, but it's when you get the revelation in your heart that it becomes part of you. And, uh, and I'm sure you've experienced this where you read a scripture, maybe you've read it hundreds of times, but all of a sudden something goes off in you. You see something you've never seen before. And that's called revelation knowledge. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And he comes to you and he, he says, let me show you something. And all of a sudden you're seeing things in a verse you've never seen before. So that's part of what our purpose here on this series is to show you things that we've heard, but maybe have got not gotten much revelation before. Now, as an introduction, let me make a statement from Adam to Jesus, a blood covenant required a blood sacrifice. That's, that's common throughout the whole Old Testament, all the way up to Jesus. The animal sacrifice, usually a lamb, was a substitute. That animal was to take the place of the two parties entering into covenant. Now, this is true whether you, we're talking about a covenant between two men or a covenant between a man and God. That animal sacrifice was to represent both sides. The understanding of entering into covenant is the two parties die to self, but killing themselves wouldn't do a bit of good for the other party or for themselves for that matter. So God allowed a substitute to be taken and that substitute would represent both sides and when that animal was killed, it is it, as if the two parties were dying then, and it's, it's that dying to self, but then they would be united in the death of that lamb and be united together as one new being. Uh, you know, and when we talk about Abraham, when God comes to him and he says, as for me, my covenant's with you, Abraham understood covenant. And his response was, um, when you first read it, you think, you know, that's uh, pretty bold of Abraham. What did he say? He said, God, what are you going to do for me? <laughs> that, that's a pretty bold question. God, what are you going to do for me? Well, Abraham really didn't have much to give God except his obedience. God had everything to give because in covenant, you give everything to your new covenant partner. Everything you have, everything you represent, strength and power and might, everything that, um, uh, I mean, literally everything you're giving to your covenant partner. In marriage, see, that's what we're supposed to be doing. This is one reason why a lot of marriages don't last because they don't understand what a covenant means. It means I no longer live for myself. I live for my covenant partner, my wife. And uh, when, when Pastor Mary and I got married, we made that commitment. 
we didn't fully understand all of this at that time, but we made a commitment that we would give our lives to each other, that we would live for each other. And that doesn't mean at times we haven't been selfish, but praise God, there's forgiveness. And that's part of what makes a marriage work is forgiveness and flexibility and continuing to trust God. Pastor Mary has had to trust God for me. I've had to trust God for her. For what? That we would both be the kind of spouse that the other one needed and that God had ordained us to be uh, in this covenant relationship. And you know, when you, when you have a wedding and they cut the cake and then they each take a drink of the champagne uh, out, of the, out of the goblet or the champagne glass or whatever, you know, they share the the bride and groom share that. The cake actually represents uh, in a covenant ceremony would be the bread that's broken, which would represent the traditional breaking of the lamb or killing of the lamb. That's what Jesus meant when he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. It wasn't physically his body being broken. At that moment, it was symbolic of the lamb that would be killed in covenant making. And uh, when, when he broke it, that, that's where the death of the lamb is represented. And when he took the cup and he said, this is my blood ratified in the new covenant, it was the blood or the, the, the wine represented the blood of the sacrificial lamb. So a memorial meal was implemented. The memorial meal was what we're familiar with is Passover or in the Christian terms, uh, communion. And God said, as often as you do this, do it to remember. Remember what? Remember what covenant is all about. Remember that you're in covenant with God. When you have communion and you break that bread, remember Jesus' body was broken for you. He bore your sicknesses, your diseases, your pain, your poverty, lack and want, oppression, depression, fear and anxiety. He bore it all so that you don't have to bear it. And of course, he bore your sins and the punishment for sin. And then when, he, when uh, you drink that cup uh, of grape juice or wine, that represents the blood of Jesus that cleanses from all sin and unrighteousness. And so every time we receive communion, we remember the covenant. When you get married, you're supposed to, have, when you eat the cake and drink the champagne, you're supposed to remember covenant. That's what it's about. All right, so God made the first covenant with Adam and Eve after they sinned. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've read, I've read Genesis and um, I don't recall any covenant uh, being made by God. Well, that's only because you don't understand the symbols of covenant. If you go to Genesis 3.21 from the Amplified Translation, it says, for Adam also and for his wife, the Lord God made long coats or tunics of skins and clothed them. Now, what is that? Well, God killed an animal and from the animal took the skins and covered their sin. Their nakedness was symbolic of their sin. God covered their sin by the death of an animal. It was a covenant sacrifice that God made on behalf of Adam and Eve. Now, it did a, it did a couple of things, but you know, somebody said, well, where'd God get the animal skins? Well, he sacrificed an animal or two animals, whatever it took. I say, well, you know, uh, <laughs> couldn't God just uh, snap his fingers and have uh, leather tunics, you know, in his hand already? That's not the point. To cover sin, there had to be a death because the wages of sin is death. So in order for that death to be satisfied, something or somebody had to die. Well, God didn't want Adam and Eve to be killed to make this agreement because there were no offspring yet. That would be the end of humanity. And so God made a way to cover man's sin temporarily, but with the promise that there would be eventually a final sacrifice that would cover all sin for all man for all time. And we'll get to that. Now, here's something that you may not have heard before or thought about. When Adam and Eve sinned, remember, 
Adam died spirit, soul, and body. Now, it took a long time for him to die physically because man was not created to die. He was created to live eternally. So, he, you know, he lived 930 years. That's a long time. But when he, he died spiritually, immediately, the moment he made that decision and, and acted on that, that disobedience to what God said, he was, died spiritually. He was separated from God. Why? Because he listened to the voice of the devil. And he followed that voice and did what that voice said instead of what God said. That cut him off from God. Well, something that we tend to forget about is that in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, and I won't read it because we've read it so many times this past few months, you probably have it memorized. But God turned over all of creation to mankind. Everything that God has created, he gave to man. Say, so, well, I'm not sure everything, maybe it was just the animals and stuff. You know, you need to read Psalms 8, verses 3 through 8, and you'll discover that it's, in fact, if you read it from the Passion Translation, it's very clear that God submitted all of creation to mankind. So here, all of a sudden, Adam and Eve sinned. They were cut off from God, but God was cut off from his creation because of sin. God couldn't just barge in and uh, give Adam wisdom and, and, and knowledge and protection and provision and stuff because God was cut off. Because when Adam sinned, not only did he separate himself from God, but the dominion, the authority, the power that God had given him over creation now was subverted, given to the devil by default. Now the devil became what the Bible calls the God of this world. Well, that was not God's plan, and uh, but God had a plan, <laughs> and that plan was to redeem mankind. And the Bible says the plan of redemption was laid from before the foundations of the world. So before this world was ever created, before God ever created man, God already had a plan in case this happened. So in order for God to get access back into this world, back into humanity, there had to be a covenant, and that covenant had to have a death in it so that God could cover their sins as this, this act of sacrifice, and then God would have access back into this world and back into the hearts and minds of mankind. Now, I'm going to do something here uh, so that uh, you can't... I'm going to blow my nose. Sorry about that, folks. I'm going to shut off the sound. All right, I'm back. Hallelujah. That's a, that's a blow your nose break. <laughs> if I was standing before the congregation, I would apologize and, and try and turn my back on the congregation for a moment. But um, on live stream like this, that's, that's what I do. Anyway, praise God. So the blood covenant that God made with Adam and Eve, even though it's not spelled out there, because God had not taught, uh, had, the, had the prophets and the writers had not taught yet on the blood covenant, uh, but God taught Adam and Eve. And how do we know this? Because when Cain and Abel came along, we can read the story in Genesis chapter four, verses one through seven, and from the Amplified Translation, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she became pregnant and bore Cain. And she said, I have gotten and gained a man with the help of the Lord. And next she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. Now, that sounds good. He's honoring God. The problem is that when you're in covenant the, the sacrifice that you make is not the fruit of the ground. It's a life. Now let's read verse four. And Abel 
brought of the firstborn of his flock and of the fat portions, and the Lord had respect and regard for Abel and for his offering. You see, where did Abel get this idea of offering God uh, uh, <laughs> the firstborn? Where did he get this idea that he should offer God the best? He got it from God when God did that for Adam and Eve and taught Adam and Eve how to continue to, to live in a relationship with God through covenant that they had lost through sin. And of course, it was an ongoing thing, had to be done year after year, so it wasn't permanent. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about that. All right, so sacrifices in covenant relationships were to be a blood sacrifice from Adam and Eve forward, as I've already mentioned. Now, I'm, I'm going to repeat myself a few times here. I just want to get points across to you. So verse 5, but for Cain, his offering and his offering, God had no respect or regard. So Cain was exceedingly angry and indignant and he looked sad and depressed. Now listen to this. See, God didn't ignore Cain. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? And why do you look so sad and depressed and dejected? If you do well or right, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well or right, sin crouches at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. So he's warning Cain, sin's trying to get a hold of you, just like the devil tempted Adam and Eve, challenging what God said, what God ordained. The devil was challenging now the one method that God had implemented to allow there to be a relationship between God and man, which was the blood covenant sacrifice. Well, Cain decided to do his own thing. It's like tipping God. You know, well, I'll give God some of the stuff that I did from my efforts. And uh, instead of taking maybe some of my fruits and veggies, take them to my brother and uh, we can make a trade, which he could have done easily. And he could have got himself a firstborn lamb and sacrificed that and been honorable before God. That would have been an act of covenant. Instead, he, he really broke covenant by not doing it the way God had ordained. And that separated him from God and sin took advantage of that. Uh, that's, that's man's attempt to do his own thing his own way. We have it today in the world. Man thinks they're God and they're going to, how many times have you heard people make comments like, well, I'm just going to, you know, live it my own way. You know, I, I, I've got people close to me in life that have made those kind of comments. Well, God understands. God knows. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna be me, and uh, you know, it's gonna be okay. Well, not necessarily. The Bible was, is very specific about how we live our lives, and it's not that God punishes us. That's not it. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. When you have so much pride that you're gonna do it your own way, that's sin. What, what, what do you mean that's sin? Well, it's disobedience to God, uh, pride goes before the fall. So when you're in pride, you're in sin. And when you think you know how to, to, you know, how to govern your life better than God, you're in pride, so you're already in sin. <clears throat> so, you know, people need to understand that you're not God and that you have to, if you want to walk in relationship with God, you have to learn to follow what he has declared because God's not trying to be a, a controlling factor in your life in the sense of, ordering you, you know, do this and do that or else. God has set things in order for your benefit. Everything God instructs you to do in the word is meant to bless you. It is meant to protect you. It's meant to defend you. It's meant to prosper you. And it's when you cross, go crossways with that and you decide you're going to do it yourself. Well, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but I'm, I'm just going to do it my own way. I don't need church. I don't need the Bible. I don't need all this religious stuff. Well, okay, prideful. <laughs> you see, you don't. sometimes people don't realize they're in pride. But the moment you start thinking you know better than God how to live your life, you're in trouble. 
because just like just like uh, Cain, you know, you offer up the wrong thing, it doesn't fulfill its purpose in your life, because God has specific things that work, spiritual laws that work, and then there's other spiritual laws that will cause death. All right, the wages of sin is death. I heard a man this week talk about us faith and prosperity preachers, you know, uh, and that how, you know, that we're just false prophets. When I say us, I'm talking about anybody that preaches the kind of stuff I preach and, and a lot of people are preaching. I don't know what they think we ought to preach, but uh, he says, you never mention sin. You never mention, uh, you know, uh, what you have to do to please God. Well, that's just absolutely not true. Apparently, they haven't really listened to our messages. But uh, the devil wants, to, wants them to believe a lie, and they're falling for it. But you know what? There is sin. And sin is simply missing the mark. When God gives us something to do, God speaks to your heart, and then you, you disobey that, that's missing the mark. That's sin. Anytime you get into disobedience, remember, whatever God tells you to do, it's for you to benefit you, to bless you. And when you decide to go against that, you're going against a spiritual principle that God's trying to implement in your life. And you've opened the door for the devil now that they will bring in other laws, the law of sin and death. Now, the Bible says that uh, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free, has, past tense, made us free from what? The law of sin and death. So we decide we're going to live a godly life. We're going to live a righteous life. And, and all you got to do is look at your life and say, does my life glorify God? Does my life represent the kind of God I claim to believe in? Or is my life more resemble the devil and the devil's people? You know, once you start figuring it out, it's time to make a change. John 10, 10, I've quoted this so many times. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He said, but I came to give you life and that in abundance. You're choosing how to live, whether you're going to live your old fleshly, self-willed, prideful life, or whether you're going to live a life of righteousness, right standing, holiness before God, will make a difference. Whether or not you walk in the, the killing, stealing, and destroying aspect of life, or whether you walk in the provision and blessing of God and abundance of God life. It's your choice. God doesn't make you do anything. What he does, he gives us the parameters that will bring us the best for our lives, that will bring, bring us the greatest outcome. We, we've quoted scripture many times where God says, I know my thoughts and my plans for you, thoughts and plans for good and not for evil to prosper you and to give you a good outcome. If you're not prospering in, in some aspect of your life, you have to stop and question, what am I doing that's allowed this to happen? Where have I opened up the door? Uh, again, could be through pride, could be through unbelief, it could be for allow, uh, through allowing fear and doubt to get in. It could be something of just disobedience. God's spoken to your heart to do and you've been fighting it. Uh, I know people that have fought God all their lives about the ministry, and uh, <laughs> the Bible says the callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind just because you don't want to do it. Doesn't mean God changes his mind. If you're called and anointed to be in the ministry, and you're out there and you're playing music in some band and nightclubs and stuff like that, you may have a great anointing in music that's meant to, to lead people in great worship of Almighty God, and you're out there playing the devil's songs, giving him the glory. I was talking to Pastor Mary here. We we both have some musical background. I grew up uh, in church, and my mother was a worship leader. She started playing the piano at age five with no lessons, just sat down and started playing. Listened to music for five years. She figured she could do it. She sat down and she did, and just could play anything. And uh, she played piano and organ in church. And uh, I grew up with that. I grew up around that. So I have an ear for music. Uh, I'm, I don't claim to be a great singer. I've uh, 
tried two instruments in my life. Uh, I played the bass when I was in junior high and high school, actually had a band. And uh, then I, I, a few years ago, I decided I wanted to learn how to play the guitar and things were going pretty good until they changed the classes on me. And it was out of college and they changed classes and all of a sudden I couldn't take the classes and the, and the instructions that were I was taking. So it kind of threw a roadblock in there. But I have some knowledge and some understanding and Pastor Mary plays the piano and she's got a fair amount of knowledge and understanding of music. Our discussion was, do you realize that no matter what language you speak, where you grow up in this world, if you can read music and play music, we have a common language around the world. Every musician, every singer, every person that can read music we speak a common language and it's music. Now, isn't it interesting that the one being in heaven that was created to bring forth worship, to bring forth uh, uplifting music was Lucifer. Uh, the Bible talks in terms of that, that music radiated from him as he, as he moved. And, and I really believe his job was to lead all the heavenly host in worship to the Father. But he perverted it, and now we, we get a perversion of that anointing, which is the world's music, the ungodly. Um, uh, just There's some music out there I, I, I would not listen to. I would not want my kids or grandkids to listen to. Why? Because the devil's original anointing got perverted and he used it against people. He uses it to uplift people in the music industry, uh, make them very popular and make them a lot of money, promise them a lot of things, but eventually a lot of them end up with drugs and alcohol and dying young because whatever he promised you is going to have some death attached to it. You got to watch out for that. All right. So let's get back to here. So God promised to Cain, if you do the right thing, won't you be accepted? In other words, if he would go and trade and, and buy a lamb from his brother and sacrifice that lamb, he would be accepted just like Abel was. But he, his pride would let him do it. Pride can be a person's downfall. All right. <clears throat> Remember, the blood covenant sacrifice not only gave God access, uh, got, gave God access back into the earth, but it gave man access to God through the covenant relationship. Without you operating in the covenant, you have no relationship with God. Now you say, well, when I pray, doesn't God hear my prayers? Oh yeah, he hears your prayers. But until you, by faith, receive what he's provided for you to be redeemed, to be born again, which is Jesus, there's not a whole lot he can do for you. A lot of people that are unbelievers, all of a sudden they get desperate and they cry out to God. And, you know, there's some instances where God can intervene, but for the most part, God's hands are tied because you're living a life for the devil. You're in covenant with the devil by, by doing the things the devil is commanding you to do and directing you to do. Instead of following the Lord, receiving uh, Jesus, the sacrificial lamb, as your Lord and Savior. So we can't blame God for our problems. The Bible says, we read this, I think it was Tuesday night, uh, Bible study, that uh, the curse causeless does not alight. In other words, the curse doesn't come on a person without some cause. That there's somewhere, there's sin or open doors of disobedience or rebellion, something that allowed the devil to get in and cause problems. And whenever we're under attack, we have to stop and ask ourselves, have I been disobedient to God? Have I, have I opened the door for this attack to come in? Or is this just the devil harassing me? You know, and you got to learn to, to decipher and, and discern between the two things. Sometimes the devil tries to attack like he did with Jesus. Jesus had no open door. He did not sin. He was not in disobedience or rebellion yet the devil attacked him. But Jesus responded with the word in each of the three temptations, and the devil left him. 
for a better time, the Bible said. Well, Jesus never gave him a better time, so the devil couldn't come back. When we're under attack, first thing is, have I messed up? Have I missed God? Have I been disobedient, rebellious, whatever it might be? And then if you can judge yourself and, and, you, and you can't find anything in there, say, Holy Spirit, there's something I'm missing. I need you to show me. And, and if, if he doesn't show you something, then you didn't understand. You're just fighting the attack of the enemy. The devil's trying to put a stop on you so you won't follow the Lord. And when the Bible says resist the devil, he'll flee. It's what you got to do. Amen. All right. Um, remember these sacrifices in the Old Testament were temporary. They had to be done periodically, usually yearly, as a way of reminding the covenant people of the covenant terms. So in, um, you know, marriage, we have what's called an anniversary. And once a year, we celebrate uh, our marriage covenant. One of the things we ought to do, I'm sure most people do not do this, but one of the things we ought to do is every year our anniversary, we ought to sit down and remember our vows. Remember our promises to each other. I don't even know if we can find our vows. I don't know. Did we ever write them down somewhere? No. <laughs> we were so young and ignorant. We, the, the priest, we, we got married in the Catholic church because Mary's family was, was Catholic and they would have it no other way. Um, I just wanted to get married. I didn't care what church it was in. <laughs> but um, the priest pretty much told us everything to say. And we repeated after him and said, I do. And he said, kiss the bride. And I did. And he said, now you're married. And we were, and we still are. 50, what we're married, we're in our 50, 51st year, or we finished 51. We're in our 51st year. We're in our 51st year. She's got to keep reminding me. I keep adding to it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, where are we here? The blood covenant sacrifice. Okay. Done periodically. Uh, and it's to remind everybody of both the blessing and the curses. Now, in a, in a blood covenant uh, between two people, two individuals, let's, let's set aside the marriage blood covenant for a minute. Two people, and this is historically blood covenant's been going on since the beginning of mankind. But in that blood covenant ceremony, there would be a blessing that would be uh, spoken out. Everything I have, everything I possess, all my power, all my authority, all my ability, I give to you. It's yours. You don't have to ask. It's yours. You can take it. And they would both do that. But they would also then follow that up with a curse. The curse could be uh, any number of things. And, uh, but ultimately the curse would end with, if you break this covenant, not only will my family pursue you, but your family is obligated to pursue you and take your life from breaking this covenant. This covenant's a life and death covenant. Well, that's pretty severe, but that's why they would have yearly remembrances where they would do a, a covenant meal. It's a memorial meal. It's what we call communion. And they would remember. Oh, I remember when we made this covenant. It, we promised this and they promised that. And uh, we've got to be sure not to break covenant. And, and that's what the memorial meal is all about. Well, Jesus, when he broke the bread and drank the wine, passed it around. He said, do this as often as you do it. Remember what? Remember this covenant. Remember my, my sacrifice. Remember the promises. And yet we take communion and we don't remember these things. It's become a religious thing for us. And, and you know, depending on what kind of church you go to, uh, you may not hear anything uh, about the blessing and the cursing. It may be just drink the bread, drink the wine, and let's move on with the service, you know. All right. Uh, let's see. In Genesis chapter 3, Verse 15, God says, I will put, now Now here's the scripture I said we'd, we'd read to let you know uh, that God made a promise of redemption to Adam and Eve. In chapter 3, verse 15 in Genesis, amplified translation, God said, I will put enmity, hatred, and hostility between you and the woman 
and between your offspring and her offspring. Now, God's speaking to the devil, the serpent. So I'll put enmity or hatred and hostility between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. So we see there's two families in the earth, one from the offspring of the woman, Mary, because that's the only woman in history that bore a child without a man involved, all right? So that she's the only one that could have fulfilled this promise. There was no seed of man to bring the sinful nature of man, okay? And then there was another family, one from the offspring of evil or the devil. Isn't that interesting? Evil, <laughs> devil, D-E-V-I-L, and evil. They, you wonder why they're so to closely tied together. Because evil is from the devil. You want to see evil in the world today? Just look at what the globalists are trying to do. Look at what they've done. Look how they've killed thousands of people, uh, you know, calling it this or that, okay? And that they want to, you know, the globalists, if you haven't gotten this, you need to do some study yourself and find out. They want to kill off 75% of the world's population. They want to do it through viruses, plagues, famines, uh, wars. That's what wars are all about, to reduce the population. It's not just about the money. All right. So Jesus is the he, because it says he will bruise and tread your head. He, how did it go from it to he? Well, it, the offspring, is he, Jesus, and that's the only one it can be. There's no other being that's been born in this earth that fulfills being the offspring of a woman. He will bruise the head of, uh, bruise your head, well, actually, it says here, um, he will bruise and tread your head, which is a symbol of authority, that the head represents authority, power, and dominion, uh, underfoot, and take back the dominion and authority belonging to man, leaving a gaping hole, and you will lie in wait and bruise his heel. And that literally means that you're going to lay in wait and sneak attack and try and catch people, uh, surprise, you know, a sneak attack kind of thing. And that's what the devil tried to do to Jesus, tried to, uh, you know, come along and give him some religious sounding quotations and see if he could trick Jesus into obeying what he wanted. And that's what he does to us. He comes along and he does sneak attacks and a lot of the devil's attacks are not so obvious. They're uh, a little bit of doubt, a little bit of fear, a little bit what if this and what if that, and, uh, you know, did this really work? Is God really true? Does that word really mean anything? Does all this faith stuff work? Does prayer work? All these are questions meant to put doubt in your mind. And that's what the devil does. He, he plagues us with these thoughts and these questions. And that's, that's what's going on here. Now, I inserted definitions when I went through and studied this and found out what some of the words there mean, that that's what we get. That's the picture we get. So Jesus would become the final sacrifice. Remember the lamb had to be uh, ultimately the, the bottom line for choosing the lamb would be a, a first, uh, a yearling. Uh, be a firstborn and had to be without spot, without wrinkle. Well, Jesus was the firstborn of his family and uh, he was without spot and without wrinkle. He was taken before the priest, the high priest. They did their inspection on Jesus just like they would on a lamb. They looked at everything in his life and even Pontius Pilate, he said, I find no fault with this man. He's done nothing wrong. And the priest knew that but yet they accused him falsely. But he was the spotless lamb of God. He never sinned. He never yielded to the temptation. He beat the devil hands down every time the devil attacked him. You say, what about when he got arrested and he went to the cross? That was him laying in his, he said, no man can take my life unless I lay it down. He submitted himself to that to take the place of you and I in death in punishment for sin, in hell, 
and then be raised spotless because he, he had, sin couldn't hold him because there was no sin there. Death couldn't hold him because of that. So God could come in by the Holy Spirit and raise him up. And the Bible says we were in him when he died. We were in him when he was in hell. We were in him when he was raised. But get this, we are in him seated at the right hand of the Father today. The, the right hand of power, dominion, and authority in the kingdom of God. That's where we sit with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. Genesis, um, now let's go to John. In John chapter 1, verse 29. The next day John seeth Jesus coming to, unto him, and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, the Jews considered John a prophet. I think when you, when you study this out, you have to accept that John the Baptist was a prophet. He spoke many prophetic things that, that came to pass. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Amplified Translation, the Apostle Paul writes, Purge and clean out the old leaven, so that you may be fresh new dough, still uncontaminated as you are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Now, he uses symbology here. He uses symbols. He talks about the cleaning out the leaven, the, the dough, uh, uncontamination. Uh, that was part of the purging, the cleansing. When they would uh, have Passover, they had to clean out everything, get the leaven out. Not anything that uh, could be considered unclean had to go out. Uh, and then they would uh, proceed with their Passover celebration. Now, what was Passover all about? Well, Passover was actually when Israel was in Egyptian bondage and God was going to deliver them from death, from bondage, from Egypt. And what he said was, I want you to take a lamb and I want you to prepare it. And then he told him how to prepare it. And he said, and you're to consume the entire lamb. Nothing's to be left over. And when, when they left Egypt, every family carried with them the lamb inside them. Now that sounds kind of gross, but that's the symbology that's showing here that in order to walk out of bondage, in order to walk into freedom, the lamb has to be in you. And today is not eating a lamb. Today is receiving the Lamb of God, Jesus. Amen? All right. The Passover Lamb was the Lamb that died so that God's people could be set free. 1 Corinthians 15, verse uh, 3 and 4 from the Amplified Translation. Now Paul says, For I passed on to you, first of all, what I also received, that Christ the Messiah, the Anointed One, died for our sins, in accordance with what the scriptures foretold, that he was buried, that he rose on the third day, as the scriptures foretold. Second Corinthians 5.21, the Passion Translation says, For God made the only one who did not know sin, that's her offspring, remember the, the seed of the woman? That's her offspring. To become sin. That's the devil's offspring. So God took a perfect human that knew no sin and laid on him all the sin and he became sin. Why? As our substitute, because we were sinners. So the perfect for the imperfect. Hallelujah. So that we who, uh, who did know sin, I'm sorry, so that we who did not know righteousness might become the righteousness of God through our union with him. Isaiah 53 verses 4 through 6, surely he has borne our griefs, our sicknesses, weaknesses, and distresses, and carried our sorrows and pains of punishment. Yet we ignorantly considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God as if with leprosy. But he who was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our guilt and iniquities, the chastisement needful to obtain peace and well-being for us was upon him. With the stripes that wounded him, we are healed and made whole. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
we have turned every every one to his own way. And the Lord has made to light upon him the guilt and the iniquity of us all. Hallelujah. Jesus paid the price. He bore our sins. He bore the punishment for our sins. Amen. I'm going to have to put a stop on it. Uh, some people say, put a cork in that, put a pin in that. Uh, well, we'll just put a stop here and we'll pick it up next week. Um, I want you to know that the covenant sacrifice was so powerful, it could deliver you from the wages of sin, which are death. It was so powerful, powerful that it could deliver you from the curse Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed you from the curse. Why? Because he bore the curse for you as your substitute. You don't have to bear it. Now, I want you to, we're going to take a minute here. I'm going to pray for you. If you need healing right now, this is your time to receive healing Amen. in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for everybody watching this program right now or listening to it. I speak to your bodies in the name of Jesus. I command the healing anointing right now to flow into you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. Every symptom of sickness, of disease, of pain, malfunctioning of any kind from your top of your head to the soles of your feet, from your brain to your toes. I command to heal every symptom of sickness and disease and malfunction. Leave your body right now in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I thank you that every symptom leaves their body. Thank you for your healing anointing. You said the anointing destroys the yoke. And I declare that the yoke of sickness and disease is destroyed. It is broken in the name of Jesus right now. According to the word of God, you are free. You don't have to be sick anymore. You don't have to be in pain anymore. Amen. If, if, um, if you're not born again, let me quickly share this. I know we're running out of time. You need to make Jesus Lord of your life. He's the sacrifice. He's the one and only way to get to heaven. He's the one and only way to get to God. Nothing else will work. And instead of doing it your way or some religion's way or something some man says, why not do what God said? Why not go to the creator and, and find out what he said and do that? which is what? Make Jesus Lord of your life. The Bible says, if you will believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, you will be saved. No doubt about it. All you got to do is say, Father, I thank you for the work of Jesus to redeem me from the curse. Jesus, come into my life. Take control of my life and be my Lord and Savior. I receive you now and I declare Jesus is Lord. I declare that Jesus is my Lord. Amen. A simple prayer like that gets you saved, gets you a place in heaven. And if you prayed that prayer, I want you to uh, consider this. I've got a book I'd like to send to you called Welcome to the Family. And if you'll ask for it, send me an email at wemmons01 at gmail.com and ask for this book. I'll send it to you free of charge because I want you to get it. I want you to know what do I do now that I got saved. This book, this little book will help you with that. Help you get started on the right path. Amen. All right. So with that, I'm going to put up on the screen um, a cover, a screenshot. And I'm going to give you some uh, information. There we go. And I can still talk behind that. Uh, there's our uh, mailing address. If you desire, you have an impression by the Holy Spirit, and you just want to give and support this ministry, or you want to become a partner and you want to send uh, checks or money orders, uh, there's our address. Make them out to CFC. That's all you got to put on there. Uh, if you have a PayPal account, there's our email address. You can find us at PayPal, and that links to our uh, ministry account. If you've got a Venmo account, there's how you find us on Venmo. And uh, let the Holy Spirit direct you and uh, whatever he impresses upon you to do. Just be obedient and do that. Um, if you want to give by debit or credit card, you can send that information to our email that you see there uh, under the PayPal account. That's our email. You can send your debit or credit card information to us there. And uh, the other option is you can text it to us at 818-679-7067. Uh, 
And uh, you say, well, what are you going to do with all that money? Well, <laughs> the sowing of seed is not so much for us, it's for you. It's what opens up the door for God to be able to bless you. The Bible says, give and it shall be given back to you. Good measure, press down, shake together, running over. God will cause men to give unto your bosom. For the tither, if you don't have a home church and you're not tithing, well, the Bible says for the tither, that when you bring your tithe into God's storehouse, that there'll be spiritual food. You're coming to our ministry, you're learning, you're growing, you're receiving spiritual food. So if you don't have a home church, this is a good place to sow that seed called the tithe. And uh, God will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing. There's not enough room to receive it all. And, and he'll rebuke the devourer for your sake. I mean, the, the promises to the tither and the giver are tremendous. All you've got to do is begin to be obedient to God. And let God minister to your heart. Amen. So we love you guys. We appreciate you. And uh, glad that you've decided to join us this morning. And we'll be back here Tuesday night, our Tuesday night Bible study. It's going to be great. And remember, every time we're on the air, it's healing time. Every time we come on until the time we go off, it's healing time. And by the way, that healing anointing doesn't stop when we go off the air. It's still the anointing, no matter when you see the program, no matter when you hear this message, the healing anointing is flowing because there's no time or distance in the spirit realm. And so every time you listen to this message, there's a healing anointing available to you. Every time, uh, you know, if you hear this a year from now, five years from now, it doesn't matter. There's still a healing anointing available. Receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right, with that, we're going to let you go. We will see you Tuesday night at 7 o'clock California time, uh, 9 o'clock Central time, 10 o'clock East Coast time. Uh, I don't know, wherever you are in the world, a different time zone, you'll have to figure it out. If you missed the program, you can go back to our church page, Covenant Faith Center, or CFC, Ministries International, uh, and everything. all of our uh, services are on there. You can go to my um, YouTube channel, uh, Pastor William Emmons, and you can find them there. And um, that way you don't have to miss anything. Amen. All right. Be blessed. Have a blessed day. Have a blessed week. And we will see you Tuesday night. I'm going to put the screenshot back up there and turn the mics off and leave it on for a few minutes before we go. Uh-oh. I shut it off accidentally. <laughs>